Hello. Good evening and welcome to the signature IMC event, Agency versus Client, where we get to explore both sides of the desk with leading industry experts. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. For those of you, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelly Cutler and I am the program director for the Medill IMC Professional Program. I'd like to extend a welcome to our current Medill IMC professional and IMC full-time students, as well as our alumni, uh, the Medill journalism students, prospective students, and our amazing Medill faculty and staff. Also a very warm welcome to our esteemed guest panelists this evening. Welcome Andrew, Beverly, Shivram, and April. And last, a huge thank you to the people who made this event possible. Thank you to Vijay, to Stacy, to Matt, and to the rest of the Medill team. We couldn't have put this event together without you. Before we get started, um, I have just a couple of quick notes. First off, to our prospective students who are interested in finding out more about the Medill graduate programs, please save the date for our upcoming informational sessions on December 1st at 12 noon central time for full-time students and December 2nd at 6 p.m. central time for those interested in the IMC professional program. Sorry about that. Um, again, December 2nd at 6 p.m. central time for the IMC professional students. More information will be available soon for you about those informational sessions. For our program this evening, we are going to start out with a brief introduction from each of our panelists, and then our keynote speaker, Andrew Swinnand of Leo Burnett, will present, which will be followed by a Q&A session with our panel. If you have questions during the event, please feel free to use the Q&A function to enter your questions, and I'll be sure to try and get to all of those questions uh, with our panel during the Q&A section. Then at 6.30, this large session will actually end, and we invite you all to join one of our panelists and a faculty member for a smaller networking session. Stacy will share links um, with you for those small group networking sessions later on in our program. So keep your eye on the chat box for that information as we go further into the session. You'll be able to select a room with one of our panelists and one of our faculty members. So Candy Lee will be joining Andrew. Beverly and Vijay will be in a room. Myself and Shivram will be in a room. And April and Roy Wallen will be in one of the rooms. So again, we'll share those links with you later on in our program. Okay. So that's all for me. Again, welcome and thank you for being here. And with that, it is an absolute pleasure and an honor to turn it over to Andrew Swinnon, the CEO of Leo Burnett. Hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. So uh, just quick background on me. Uh, right now, I am the CEO of the Leo Burnett Group here in Chicago. Uh, I also am the CEO of uh, all of the Central Region for Publicis. Uh, communications. And I've been doing that for about three years. I actually uh, started my career in the Army. Uh, I had good grades and no money. Joined the Army when I was 17. Uh, went to uh, Wharton and Penn. The Army paid for it. Uh, was an infantry officer. Uh, and when I got out, uh, like many of you, was trying to figure out what to do. And uh, I figured my mom was an artist. My dad worked in business, so I would go in advertising. Um, went to work for BVDO, and uh, there my boss was from PNG, and uh, in the early 90s, ended up moving to Cincinnati to work for Procter & Gamble. So I was on the client side for a while. Uh, in the late 90s, I had won an innovation award and actually uh, helped start Procter's uh, digital group at the time uh, and moved to San Francisco. Uh, in 2000 market crash, Procter side, the internet wasn't a thing. And I ended up uh, linking up with a man named Rashad Dubakawala moving to Chicago with a group that became Starcom. Um, Starcom, it was the first month it started, was there. I became president of SMG. Um, we grew from like 800 people to about 6,000 in the world's largest media agency. Um, and when I left that, uh, I was traveling about 500,000 miles a year. My kids were young and I started a venture incubator.
about it and share my perspective. So thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Beverly Wright. Very excited to be a part of this panel tonight. I uh, currently uh, play the role of a deputy program manager at DDB, an agency here in Chicago on the account management side. Um, and my client is the US Army. Uh, so Andrew, I might be picking your brain later for some thoughts uh, from your experience. So a very rewarding client. My career has traveled the gamut in terms of the types of clients I've worked on. I've worked on everything from Windex to scrubbing bubbles to Tampax to Botox and now the US Army. Uh, so one thing for sure, this industry is never dull, uh, never boring, and every client in every category offers a very, very unique experience. I knew I wanted to go into advertising from a very uh, young age and studied advertising at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, and I actually continued my education um, with Northwestern. So it's been a great journey. It's an amazing um, industry and it's never dull. And I'm working on one of the most rewarding clients I've worked on yet in my career with the US Army. So very happy to be here tonight. Hi everyone, I'm Siobhan Baidiz Warren, um, proud Medill alumni, class of 2007. I'm um, excited to be with you here today, and thank you for taking the time to listen to us and chat with us. Um, you know, I'm proud to say my journey started at Medill. Um, I was uh, a student here at the IMC program, and I think, you know, Medill has always been ahead of the curve. Um, we were learning about social media and loyalty and segmentation and guest engagement and customizing and personalizing advertising, um, you know, 13 years ago now, which is crazy to say. And from there, I've actually been at, within the restaurant industry now for you know 13 plus years. Um, I started my career at uh, Taco Bell, uh, working with them both in brand marketing as well as uh, for their domestic team, and then leading uh, international marketing, helping to launch the brand in several countries around the world, including Japan and China and Brazil and Korea and several others. Um, so it was an amazing journey and then I've been able to take that experience and move into kind of the startup world of restaurants with both Tender Greens and Blaze Pizza. Um, and now as Chief Marketing Officer of Jamba, um, leading the rebrand in charge of uh, how we can continue to take a brand that's 30 years old and make it relevant for the next 30 years. So thanks for taking the time to chat today. And I'm going to pass it over to April. Hello, everyone. I'm April Carlisle. Uh, I have connectivity with Andrew, uh, not only uh, because of my Procter & Gamble experience, uh, but also I have the opportunity to work at the Leo Burnett Group. So I started my career uh, straight out of college in sales, actually, for Procter & Gamble, worked my way up through the ranks. And you heard Andrew talk about how P&G is constantly innovating and coming up with new ways to go to market. And so P&G was actually a pioneer in a field of marketing referred to as shopper marketing, meaning you were marketing your brands in the context of the shopping occasion with our customers. So I was one of the pioneer shopper marketers at Procter & Gamble and eventually led the Center of Excellence for Shopper Marketing at P&G. At the time, I was working with several agencies in Chicago, and I got the, the uh, desire to flip over to the agency side. So I worked at Leo Burnett Group within ARC, which is the kind of shopper marketing component of Leo Burnett. And I was there for about five years. P&G became my client and so did Coca-Cola uh, as well as other clients. Uh, I led shopper marketing um, and new business development for ARC while I was there. And then Coca-Cola uh, reached out and asked if I would come and lead shopper marketing for them. So I'm currently leading um, all of our shopper marketing efforts for Coca-Cola and absolutely loving the experience. And I think I'm taking it back to Andrew. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I have a little...
Um, I've had a lot of different careers, but I, a lot of the people I talk to and mentor uh, feel like a great weight on trying to pick what to do. And like my starting point is, I think it doesn't really matter. And my biggest thing is take a first step and start. It, uh, it was funny, one of my good friends from college um, was waiting and waiting for the perfect job and he ended up waiting like four years. Then he had a hard time getting a job because he couldn't explain why he hadn't worked in four years. So, you know, I think uh, my, my, my biggest thing is like, take a swing, step out, get something and, and see how it works. But, you know, with that, I have uh, five thoughts on how to think about uh, client side versus agency. Um, and the first one is, is know thyself. And if you don't, test and learn. And, and the, the big point here is basically, uh, one of the biggest differences for me between client and agency, agency is much more of a quick turn business. It's interesting if you think about advertising, uh, you know, in context, it's generally three to five month assignments uh, to basically launch new campaigns, come up with new ideas, reposition brands. And it's rapidly changing and evolving. You know, if you juxtapose that, when I worked at Proctor, I worked on launching a new product. My, uh, my claim to fame at Proctor was coming up with clinical strength um, antiperspirant uh, in like 1996, but uh, it was a year and a half long project. And I think the thing that's interesting is most client side assignments are longer lead and a little bit slower. Agency is a little faster. You know, I was talking with April yesterday. We've both been in uh, same places and uh, different times. But it's interesting, agencies by nature, it's faster paced, it's a little bit more chaotic. Um, client side jobs are basically, uh, it's a little bit more stable, a little bit more nine to five. Um, so, you know, one of the things I always start with people is, you know, what culture, what environment do you most thrive in? You know, are you someone who likes things very structured? You want to know the answer, you want to know the next step. Um, or are you someone who basically is, is thriving on um, and inspired by uh, a little bit of a white piece of paper and blank space in the unknown? And the thing I will offer too is in terms of, of test and learn is, uh, you know, I went from agency to client to agency to venture capital and back to agency. Uh, you can change. And, and I think part of the whole thing with test and learn is um, by starting out, you can basically get a taste of what things are like. And if you don't like it, change. Um, but you can start to get a flavor. So, you know, my second thing um, in it's related is, is what is your zone of genius? And the thing is, is, if the first part is knowing what you like, the second kind of core idea here is knowing what you're good at. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting story. Uh, there was a, an individual I who knew really, really well and wanted to get into uh, uh, work at a, in creative and advertising. And I had, a, I had started my own creative agency when I was uh, owned the VC. And she came to work for me and she really, really struggled. And she struggled in terms of how to talk about creative work. Um, and it was interesting, you know, we had, uh, I had gone to her uh, with her to a grocery store and basically asked her just to talk about products and she struggled to do it. Um, and it was interesting because I had worked with her previously and she was the one of those brilliant analytic minds I knew, um, you know, knew her numbers left, right and center. But when it came down to like uh, Old Spice versus Secret, why is one made for a man? Why is one made for a woman? What's the difference? What do the implications of color, of font, of music all uh, mean in process? Today's day and age within agencies, you know, there's a lot of digital analytics. Um, there's media agencies, which is much more knowing your numbers. You know, it was interesting when I uh, when I was president of Starcom, uh, we had a uh, uh, online test that you would take to pre-qualify candidates. It was like five questions, but one of them was, "I am comfortable and like math." 
Um, and the reason was it was media buying and planning. And so much of it was making sure that your numbers added up. So you didn't buy, you know, $10 million of media when you only wanted to buy one. Um, true story from McDonald's. Um, but about two thirds of the candidates would click no and they would automatically disqualify. Um, and again, you know, for Starcom, accuracy was critically important to what we did. So, you know, my, my second kind of core thought to you is if you think about what you love doing for Starcom, we wanted people who knew and were able to be comfortable with numbers and people who were be accurate. What was interesting though, is you became more senior at Starcom, it moved to strategy and you need to be a better strategist. You know, for a Leo Burnett, if you're on a client side or even more so on creative, being comfortable with design, with creative concepts, with ideas. Um, you know, and I would juxtapose that, uh, you know, at P&G, it was much more of a general management track. And within that, um, the strategy of business, uh, you know, if you think about uh, marketing as four Ps, in Proctor, only 10 to 20% of what you were doing was actually advertising. You know, you were also working with pricing and doing pricing analysis. You were working with manufacturing and distribution. You were working with the sales team. Um, and within Proctor, it was much more uh, a disciplined approach to strategy. Um, it was much more structured, uh, much more longer lead time. The, you know, sales cycle, the sell-in to retailers, um, we're six months out uh, at a minimum. So, you know, I, I think part of it is, is when you think about what you're good at um, and where you thrive, think about, uh, you know, in terms of environment, um, you know, your comfort uh, and what gives you energy, it helps to guide you one way or the other. Um, my third, uh, Janet Jackson and the Elephant. So this may date me, but Janet Jackson is famous for her song control. One of the other huge differences I found between agency and client is control. And the reason is, is because as an agency, ultimately your job is to recommend. So uh, it's a service-based business. And in service-based businesses, you're not the decision maker. So as an agency, you are coming up with ideas, you're partnering with clients, you're developing new concepts, and you're presenting them to the client. But it's also an environment where you have to be really comfortable with the word no, because you put your heart and soul into something, client comes back and says, no, we're not doing that, and you're done. Um, and the thing that's interesting about it is, uh, you know, for some people, it's really frustrating. Uh, another story, uh, I had an incredible uh, leader who I worked for when I first started at BBDO, and uh, he actually was from Proctor, um, you know, Harvard MBA, brilliant, brilliant individual. Um, we had basically uh, sat down in a meeting with a client. We had presented work, the client had rejected the work, and afterwards, he had basically, you know, sat down with the client and told him, why it was a bad decision and what a, you know, he got aggressive in telling him that it was a stupid decision. And the client was like, you know what, uh, you work for me, I never wanna see you again. Um, and for me, it was early in my career and it was just really reinforced the fact that clients are giving you their money and it's their money and you're at service of them. The flip side of that is the elephant. You know, the benefit you have in an agency is you actually, because you're not the decision maker, get to push the boundary as far as you can and be a little bit of pirates. The challenge with client side is as the decision maker, uh, you have to manage the elephant and you often are the elephant in the room. So, you know, the flip side at Proctor was when you would get something you'd like or you had something you wanted to do, you had layers of approval. Um, you know, it was interesting when, uh, when I had had this this whole idea for clinical strength antiperspirant, we presented it to you know, the marketing director who then said, here's five reasons it's not a good idea, go back and test these five things. You know, four months later, we presented to the general manager, here's why it's not gonna work, go back and test these five things. Four months later, present to the president. It was a year and a half of, of proof of concept and again, uh, I understand why Proctor, you know, it was building a new line for the factory, repackaging everything, sell it to the retail. It's a bigger.
Andrew, we seem to have lost your audio. Emic and the client, you have to control. But you know, I had a, a boss who said you're you're always someone's uh, assistant brand manager. Um, you know, and she was the president of the division at the time. You're constantly having to manage the different stakeholders and sell in, and it's it's a greater degree of of managing uh, politics up and down. Um, and again, because you're writing the check and it's a bigger investment. Um, my fourth thought, uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, so it's interesting. One of the things I like about agencies uh, is that you get to work on a lot of things. You know, when Beverly introduced herself, she was listing off, here's all the brands I've worked on. Here's all the categories I've worked on. You know, I've sold everything from, you know, be it Coke to, you know, recruited for the U.S. Army. So again, with agencies, uh, you tend to move from account to account much more quickly. You get to see a broader variety of businesses. You get to be exposed to more things. So, you know, it's fun that way. The flip side of it, you know, when I talk about an inch deep, you know, specific to an agency, you are managing one narrow section of what is the marketing universe. So if you think about four Ps, promotion and advertising is a small part. You know, as a general manager at a PNG or, you know, a, a, a leader at a Taco Bell, you know, you're managing menu, you're managing the pricing, you're managing the look and feel of the store. And, and, you know, ironically, I actually feel the best agency best clients are ones who have worked at agencies because they understand how to nurture a creative idea. They understand the power of brand. Um, you know, and again, you know, uh, April is, is one of those unicorns who have been to both and been successful at both, but it's a really good benefit because you have both breadth and depth. Um, but again, it's a trade-off, uh, you know, as an agency, you're going more rapidly on a smaller scope. A consultant who came to talk to us and, and he had been uh, the lead partner Andrew, we're getting some funky audio. Um, you're kind of going in and out on your but audio. Some mornings in India, he would get up, it would be 100 degrees. He said it would just be oppressively hot. And he said and it was challenging just to, to motivate yourself to get up and, and walk across the room. He said he found mornings in the south of France, he would wake up and the, the air was fresh and he would walk eight miles before breakfast. And his analogy was companies are exactly the same way. And the key point I want to make here is as you think about what to do, um, you know, I have worked in groups and teams at P&G, which were incredibly nimble, incredibly dynamic and incredibly, uh, you know, innovative. Um, you know, I've also worked at groups at the agency, which were incredibly oppressive and stifling. And I think one of the core things is, as you think about where to go, um, take a minute to get the smell of the place and think about the culture. You know, uh, is it a culture that's investing in people? Is it a culture that aligns with your values? You know, is it a culture where basically you get a sense um, that it's kind people and good people who are going to invest in your future? And the reason I share that is if I, if I had to pinpoint 
one thing that has helped me throughout my career and made me successful, it's having a good boss and a boss who was invested in me, who trained me. Um, you know, I had shared the story. Uh, the reason I ended up at Proctor is because my boss from BBDO inspired me to go there. Um, you know, one of my mentors, Renetta McCann, got a Lifetime Achievement Award yesterday. Uh, but again, um, Renetta basically investing in my future. Um, Rashad Tabakawala, I've been fortunate to have people who have, have nurtured me. So, you know, uh, I know for a lot of entry level jobs, it's harder to pick your boss. But, you know, what I would encourage you all, be it agency or, or a client, to spend some time to get the smell of the place and see what their commitment is to their people, to training, and to doing good things. So, you know, with that, um, wanted to just open the floor for questions uh, for the panel, and I will stop sharing so you can see us all. Um, but uh, would love to hear your thoughts and questions. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. Really appreciate your remarks. Um, to all of the attendees, please feel free to use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit questions for us. Um, we'd love to take your questions. We've um, got a few that we're going to go ahead and, and get started with. But again, feel free to use that uh, function at the bottom of Zoom in the middle of there, um, which has the Q&A button. So um, first off, um, quick question. And I think this might be um, a good one for someone uh, who has made the shift um, from the agency to the client side. So April, maybe you could take this one to start us off. Um, the question is, what suggestion would you give to someone who only has agency experience and is hoping to shift to the client side? Sure. So, you know, one of the key things that I would say is um, what you would want to highlight in your agency experience would be the number one is leadership opportunities. Um, what I mean, every business is looking for that, but that is so critical on the client side. And as you heard Andrew talk about the layers of decisions that uh, decision makers within a client that you need to be a strong leader that can uh, people want to follow you. Right. Um, so definitely you would want to highlight leadership opportunities. You would also want to highlight where you've had um, ability to do a project from start to finish. So a lot of times in agencies, you kind of jump in and you do your bit and then you jump back out. Client side, as Andrew mentioned, you're often owning a project from start to finish. And so where you can highlight kind of what we call end to end, um, where you've done that kind of work is uh, specifically valued. The last thing I would say is um, sales often gets a bad rap. Um, and, you know, when you're in an agency side, you're selling your ideas to the client. And when you're on the client side, you're actually selling your ideas to consumers or you're selling them to retailers or to providers. So um, a little good salesmanship and how you've been able to persuade people to um, uh, buy an idea is always valued. Great advice. Thank you, April. Um, April, I've got another question for you, just kind of changing gears, but I think it's, it's right in your wheelhouse. We have a, a student who's asking a little bit more about, she'd like to know a little bit more about what is entailed in shopper marketing and, and kind of, can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Yes. So I'm a proud adjunct professor at Northwestern and teach a whole class on shopper marketing. So feel free to take my class. And uh, I actually partner uh, with uh, another um, friend of mine, Elizabeth Harris, and uh, we co-teach the class together. And she's a proud Leo Burnett uh, leader as well. Um, but shopper marketing is literally taking the brand marketing um, uh, ideas and creative and how do you put that in the context of when people are in a shopping environment. So if you are at Walgreens or you are on a Walmart app or you are on a Walgreens um, website or you're at Disney World, it is all about how do you take the brand's um, equities and how do you pair that with wherever the brand is going to show up in a uh, shopping environment. Um, it's a fascinating, it is the fastest growing part of marketing, and it is um, just a wonderful place to work. If I could build on that too, it's uh, commerce and how people buy. 
is exploding in terms of evolution and innovation. You know, if, if you look at COVID, uh, you know, we have clients who went from 6% to 30% uh, curbside, online, um, you know, even the very definition of like how stores are laid out is changing and shopper marketing is exploding. You know, I, uh, the analogy I always use, if, if across the street is too far and tomorrow's too late, um, what's the price of convenience? Um, you know, and, and it's fascinating the way things are evolving. You know, Amazon's is going into brick and mortar. Brick and mortar is going into online. Shopper's the one figuring all that out. Great points, thank you so much. And actually that's a great transition to the, our next question. Um, which is, I think, a good one, perhaps, for Beverly. Um, and the question is, how has COVID-19 impacted the overall agency culture? Oh, you're on mute, Beverly. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there's so much about the agency environment that thrives on community and the creativity that happens when you're together and you're ideating together, solving problems together. And so uh, transitioning to a work from home environment has definitely been different and a challenge, but I think the nature of the creativity in the agency doesn't die because of that. And I think we found ways to connect uh, more so um, in very deliberate ways. And of course, Zoom, WebEx, Teams has become our friend but it's really about making sure you have those moments where you can connect outside of just the day-to-day -day because what happens is so much happens in the hallways of an agency. Um, it's not just the meetings, it's not just the phone calls, but it's the hallway conversations when you can maybe tackle an issue or pull someone aside in a conference room and address it. And I think to manufacture that when you're all working from home takes a lot of effort. And sometimes it's just about setting time on calendar with your team just to connect not necessarily about the project, but just to connect as people as a virtual happy hour and not focus on anything that's work related. But it's critical that you maintain connection because what makes the engine of an agency work is that collaboration. And so all of the things that you have to do to go to the extremes to make sure that's manufactured in this environment of COVID and work from home is critical, but absolutely essential to the creative process. So it's been a interesting ch a transition, but now we're at a new normal. And what's really interesting is there's lots of conversations about, well, what will the normal be when we actually return to the office? Because now we've gotten in the rhythm of being able to work and blend work stuff with home life. And for some that's a challenge, but it's become this very natural blend. And I had a person on my team say the most amazing thing about working from home even though it presents challenges, that person was able to watch their child take their first steps, something they would have missed if they'd actually been in the office working. So figuring out the positives um, and working through the negatives has been a critical um, thing to accomplish, but I think it's going pretty well. Thank you, yeah. It uh, reminds me a little bit of how I feel about the Medill IMC program. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the very similar sort of situation that we're in as well, where we, we miss seeing each other in the hallways and, you know, the time before and after class and on breaks where we're all able to get together and, and chat and, you know, students popping in for office hours. We really miss that, but we've tried to do our very best to replicate those experiences in new and unique ways using the, the tools that we have. So thank you for that, Beverly. Um, the next one I think would be really good for uh, Shivram, um, sort of an interesting uh, concept, which maybe you'll have some, some remarks on. So the question is, I've heard that in order to work on the client side, you have to do your time on the agency side. Any thoughts about that? I'm not hearing from Shivram. Maybe April, you'd like to comment on that since you've you've done your time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I actually uh, pivot back to what Andrew was saying. Is there isn't a certain path that you need to take? So if there is a client or a brand that you have passion for, and by the way, that's critical to be on the client side. Is that you're a passionate. Um, uh, advocate. So I'm proudly wearing my Coca-Cola jacket with my Coca-Cola background and drinking Coca-Cola products and 
And so it's really important on the client side that you have a passion for the, the brands that you're representing. Um, and so, no, I don't think it's a requirement. Um, and in fact, I, I didn't, I never envisioned that I would be on the agency side. Um, but when, a, when a, an agency leader saw the skills and capabilities, they said, have you ever considered working on the agency side? So it really is about, you know, just start wherever, <laughs> wherever there's an opportunity. I mean, I actually started in sales, tromping around downtown Chicago, calling on retail stores in the middle of the winter, setting up displays. My mother was, you know, she's like, that sounds like a horrible job. But I loved it. And I loved calling on retail. I mean, I could have never imagined that I would have ended up um, doing all the work that I've done. So to Andrew's point, like I, I whatever is available, get going and give it a go and, and things will lead their way towards um, whatever your path is supposed to be. So I think this is a really good follow up to that, April. Um, and the question is, to what extent is it beneficial to be in house versus going with an agency in terms of knowing the brand's voice? Um, versus having kind of a fresh view, which avoids insular or bubble thinking? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and a lot of places have both. Um, that's the case at Coca-Cola. We have both in-house um, resources and we um, uh, use uh, agency partners as well. So I don't think one is better or different than the others. I think one of the interesting challenges of being in-house is that sometimes you get blinders on and you're not looking to see what's happening out in the world. You get very comfortable with the work that you think has done the best um, that easily everyone will say yes to. Um, and, and when you bring in a third party agency uh, partner, um, they help bring that outside in thinking, they help push you um, and they help you uh, think differently. So I don't think there's one that enables more than the other. And, and I think uh, Coke is not unique in that many companies are looking for a hybrid model of some things being done in-house and some things being um, done uh, outside. Great, thank you. Um, I think actually this would probably be a good question for Beverly, again, if I can toss this one over your, in your direction. If anyone else has thoughts, this is a, an interesting question. So the question is, I find when working in an agency, the different teams like social media, art, copy, get siloed, which affects the quality of the work for the client. How can agencies avoid that problem and be more collaborative across teams? Yeah, that's a um, great question. And I think today's I would say I've been in the industry for quite a while and I've seen so many evolutions in the industry and how they operate. And right now, integrated marketing is critical um, to any outcomes. When we're creating ideas now for clients, it starts with from a very people-centric lens. And that's one thing that I think unites the client side and the agency side is at the end of the day, it's customer centricity that has to be at the core. Whatever we do, is about ultimately the customer. If it's from an advertising standpoint from an agency, you wanna create communications ecosystems that actually understand how prospects engage. If you're on the client side, whether it's about pricing or whether it's about the end restaurant experience, it's still all about how do you ultimately appeal to um, the people and the customer. And so right now on the US Army account that I work on at DDB, we have an integrated agency uh, wheel of nine agencies working on behalf of the U.S. Army. And everything we develop, every project we have, we make sure that every agency has a role within all of those programs. Because if anything is looked at in a siloed fashion, that entire ecosystem, that entire communications marketing ecosystem can fall apart. So I think traditionally in the past, it was very much looked at from a standpoint of, Let's create the idea and then let's just understand how that translates to a social media idea or how that translates to um, uh, relationship marketing. But that's not the way we develop ideas anymore. Ideas are developed from a very customer centric lens. You come up with an idea platform and that has to be an idea platform that everyone is equally vested in, making sure it is expressed in a way that's compelling. And I think that is um, fast forward to today and the way people consume media and the importance of social media and the overall way you're gonna engage most of the generations, particularly Gen Z, social media can't be an afterthought. It has to be at the center 
of all of the, um, the idea generation process. And that's the way we organize. I think most clients need agencies to organize that way today. That's interesting that you mentioned social media. I have a specific question about that actually. Um, so the question is from someone who's saying that they actually currently work in paid social and would like to expand into other areas of marketing. Um, any suggestions from the, from the group in terms of how to make that switch? Um, Beverly, maybe we'll start with you on that one. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I think um, personally, I think long gone are the days of people um, being one dimensional um, in the industry. And in fact, when I look across the people on my team and I look across the people that we try to hire, we try to hire people who are incredibly multifaceted in so many different ways from a standpoint of data and analytics, everything social, everything digital. So for me, um, I don't necessarily feel like that is a huge transition. I think it's really, it all again goes back to understanding um, at the end of the day, understanding the, the, the target audience, the customer. And I think from a paid social standpoint, being able to take those elements that you've learned about that and leverage that and show how that impacts the overall marketing ecosystem and communication structure, I think is just as valid as someone who's come in and said, I've had tons of broadcast experience or someone who's come in and said, I've had tons of website experience. I think we're in a very modern era of communications then I think a lot of the disciplines that have been looked at as disciplines that are auxiliary disciplines have now come to the forefront of some of the most critical disciplines that are required to actually build um, a bit more modern communication structure, particularly connecting with the, um, our tar target audiences of today. So I don't think it's a difficult transition at all. And I think um... That is a really nice segue into another question that we have really about what you all look for from junior team members who are who are coming on board. Um, Shivram, maybe you can talk a little bit about that as a, an IMC graduate and also someone who has hired lots of folks. You know, talk a little bit about maybe some of the hard skills that you look for as well as some of the soft skills. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that. I got kicked out and, uh, you know, we're working through some bad weather here, unfortunately, in the South. So apologize. Um, you know, from uh, a, a new team member perspective, especially someone joining onto the team, I think, you know, one of the first things I'm looking for is I want someone who is hungry to learn the business. I want someone who wants to dive deep and really understand, number one, uh, about my brand. Number two, how we make money and what are the key areas that we need to focus on and then number three what are our combined goals and how we can work together to solve those i think those are really critical um you know i think for me especially in the restaurant industry getting into the restaurants is really critical um, being able to get behind the counter working and understanding how our business works because We've done that with a lot of our agency partners recently, and it's been, uh, you know, amazing because they come back and the ideas that we have, the creative that we get to see, the strategies that are brought forth um, are completely different than where they were before because they truly understand how our business works, which I think is really, really, really important. Um, you know, from a hard skills perspective, I think you need someone who understands insights really well. You want someone who has that strategic background but can communicate succinctly. Um, and also, I think, understands, especially from uh, uh, the world that we live in today, social media incredibly well. Um, I know Beverly was talking about that as well. And I think the more knowledge that you have of not only the platforms that we are using, you know, even just from a, a monetary and budgetary standpoint, but also the tracking that can now be done as a benefit with these platforms and the return on ad spend that you can find, um, it makes it a, a much easier conversation to go spend that money because you can now track its performance much better than you were before. I think that's good news for the IMC students. I think that's a, a large area of focus here within our program. So it's, it's great to hear that. Um, I'm just curious, Andrew, did, did you maybe have anything to add to that in terms of what you look for with hard skills as well as soft skills with more junior employees? Sure, for me, I, I, I honestly think for most people starting out, uh, we don't expect people to 
you know, have every skill or a broad range of experience because by definition they're new. For me, I think the, you know, if I had two things to look for, it's, it's curiosity and communications. Uh, you know, curiosity, uh, I, I feel like so much of marketing, you know, human understanding, like, uh, you know, uh, analytics, all of it is like a curiosity to understand what's going on in the world. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I can't tell you how many people send me emails saying, I would love to work for Leo Burnett. Um, and you, you know, some of these people, you, you do an informational interview, you say, well, why do you want to work for Leo Burnett? Like, tell me one ad you like that we've done. And they can't think of one. And I always wonder, like you say you love Leo Burnett, you can't think of a single ad that we've done. They're all over our website. Um, but so for me, like curiosity, my second is communications. Uh, you know, again, uh, it's so many of the soft skills, but sending thank you notes, uh, following up. Uh, it's, uh, I feel like if you have someone who's curious, who's a good communicator, I can teach them uh, you know, all of the software skills, social, um, you can teach them shopper, you know, to April's example, like no one, no one knows shopper marketing when they start, but if you're curious and you're a hustler, you can teach them. So, you know, for me, I, I think, uh, you know, it's people who have done their homework and are curious and know a little bit about what it is we're doing, know thyself, um, and then who communicate well and say like, this is why, this is why I want to work here and have good discipline, uh, hygiene on follow up and you know, all the little things that say I, I, uh, I'm going to, I have, I have discipline and, and rigor in how I approach the job interview and therefore I'm going to do well with your clients and customers. Curiosity and communication. I like that. Easy to remember a true marketer. <laughs> so, Shivram, I want to go back to you real quick um, as a, a quick follow-up. So you've, you've outlined some important skills and some things that students should be thinking about. Um, how can they best demonstrate that? How do they put their best foot forward in order to actually land the job? Um, I think in order to land the job, uh, a big part of it is going to be, one, I think during the interview process, uh, being able to understand what the role is that they're looking for, and then what are those skills that they have had in the past that are transferable. Um, I think a lot of folks, especially from uh, the IMC world, maybe coming from different parts of business, different parts of marketing, um, and if they're moving in or making a career transition, you may not have that direct skill that someone is looking for, but making sure that you can go back through and understand how I can translate some of the work that I've done from either a management perspective, a creative perspective, an insights perspective, um, into something that this new role is looking for, I think is critical because uh, that way you're having a great conversation about how you can take that skill and bring it into a new light, but also that you can then learn on how to do something exactly the way it needs to be done at that organization. Uh, I had worked in finance for a couple of years. And so coming into IMC and, and leaving IMC, I needed to take the skills that I had that were probably more general project management based and translate those to how am I going to take not only what I've learned at IMC, but then the work experience that I've had in the past and move that into a role of brand management. So being able to combine those, I think will be really important. That's great. Yeah. And we encourage our IMC students to gather all the work product that they put together throughout their time in this program and, and create a portfolio. So I think that's also a good reminder for students to, uh, to capture the work that they're doing in this program because it's incredibly high level and, and very valuable. So just a, a note there. And um, I, I was going to say one, one thing there is just yeah, like, I think we did a lot of client projects. And, and I think if that's still part of the IMC curriculum today, those client projects were super helpful um, because you were able to have real world experience that I really appreciated that you could take and say, well, here's actually what we've done for some of these Fortune 500 major project, major companies. Um, so not only are you taking that experience from your, your past, but also what you're doing in the program. Um, so you can show those tangible results. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, and students are delivering really quality outputs here in this program. Um, Question for you, April, about something you mentioned earlier. You talked about when you're on the agency side, you get to, you know, sort of work on a lot of different things and it, it sort of keeps it exciting. Um, 
when you move over to the client side, um, you know, how do you keep it interesting? And also, are there more or less opportunities for career growth? So sort of a two-parted question. Yeah. So um, to keep it interesting on the client side, um, one of the ways to do that is to move around within the organization. So as I mentioned, I started out in sales at Procter & Gamble, and then I moved into marketing, and then I moved into shopper marketing. Um, uh, people from P&G start in engineering, and they move into marketing, believe it or not. Um, so what you do more um, versus in an agency, you tend to be in a vertical, you're in creative or you're in account or you're in strategy. Um, client side, you have the opportunity to work on all different facets, usually, of the business. And the more opportunities you have to work across um, different um, parts of the organization, that enables you to be, as Andrew said, kind of a general manager. And, and that's typically what you're trained to be is, is more of a general manager when you're on the, the client side. Um, and the, but I would also say, I mean, I, you know, leading shopper marketing, I work across our entire portfolio of brands. So everyone, of course, knows, you know, Coca-Cola, but, uh, you know, I also work on Smart Water and I work on um, Dunkin' Donuts Ready to Drink Coffee and I work on Diet Coke, which is my favorite. Um, I work on Powerade. I work on Gold Peak Tea. And so every one of those brands has its own personality, its own um, way that it goes to market. And selling ready to drink coffee is very different than selling sparkling water. So, um, and even at PG, I worked on everything from baby care to fem feminine protection to beauty to health. So, client side, you get uh, lots of opportunities to, to do uh, work and, and keep it interesting. Those are great examples. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so an interesting question about um, sort of creativity. And it, this is a good one for probably everyone on the panel, but I think maybe I'll throw this to, to you, Beverly, because you've, you've mentioned early on you know, about some of the different products and, and different um, accounts and, and projects that you've worked on. Um, what job have you had in your career that was the most creative or what was the, your favorite campaign that you worked on and why? Wow, uh, favorite campaign. I might get in trouble if I uh, pick, so I need to uh, think very thoughtfully about this. Um, I, I've had a lot of um, wonderful campaigns. I'll kind of give uh, two examples. Uh, one is the current example um, for the U.S. Army. Uh, we launched a new campaign right around last November, and it's called the What's Your Warrior campaign. And the reason that was a super exciting campaign is when people think about the U.S. Army, they tend to think about boots on the ground, combat, and war. And, uh, and they also see, of course, uh, the media has a great influence on um, that perceptually as well. And I think one of the most illuminating things that I've learned since being uh, working on the U.S. Army is that the U.S. Army is full of some of the most versatile and adaptable, uh, skilled people in different areas. Um, do you want a STEM career? You can do that in the Army. Do you want to be a world-class surgeon? You can do that in the Army. And this particular campaign was one of the first campaigns to really bring to light the diversity of careers, because I think a lot of folks think that the Army um, is chosen when you might not have another option. And for some, that might be true. Um, but for so many, the Army is chosen deliberately because they know um, that there's so much opportunity in the Army. And in the Army, a lot of those careers that people don't know about can be pursued at a level of excellence that you wouldn't even get um, in private, uh, private commercial industry. So it's a very rewarding campaign because it gives uh, great respect and pays uh, great um, uh, homage to the fact that there's so many different talented people in the Army. And I think, unfortunately, the world sometimes thinks about the Army um, one dimensionally, uh, and it's so much richer than that. So the What's Your Worry campaign was a huge achievement for us to get that out and start to help this new generation of prospects know that there's so much more to the army than what you've seen. So that's one. And I don't know if I have time for another, so I, I'll pause there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was actually gonna see if Andrew had anything to add to that. Um, just curious, Andrew, if you have anything that comes, pops into your mind when we when we talk about creativity. Oh, no, it's, it's uh, I'm chock full. So uh, I mean, we work we're doing right now with Bank of America, what would you like the power to do? We did work with uh, 
we did with cores uh, on uh, cores light with chill. Um, I actually worked on the army as well with the whole army of one campaign. So um, I loved all that work, but uh, a lot to a lot of a lot of fun things we've worked on, a lot to be proud of. So great. So this, I think, is a really, really important question. And actually, I'm going to um, maybe check in with you, Beverly, and see if you want to answer this one. Um, is the work-life balance very different between agency versus client side, or is it more dependent on the company itself? I think that's a really important question for us to, to talk about when, when students are thinking long term. Yeah, um, I haven't worked on um, the client side, so I would be talking about it from the perspective of the agency side and the clients that I've worked with. I think it varies greatly. Um, I think certain agencies have a culture. Um, so I know Andrew really mentioned that idea of kind of like smell the place. Um, I think that's really important to understand culturally the agency. I think different accounts naturally require a faster pace. Um, I've worked on lots of packaged goods accounts and those tend to turn slightly more slowly. Um, I worked on McDonald's and it's quick serve restaurants. And as you can imagine, that operates much more rapidly. So I think it depends on the type of account. I think it depends. Uh, it's very important to kind of understand your genuine interest in the sort of category of product. And again, I think it's incredibly important to investigate um, what sort of agency culture um, you would thrive best in. From my impression of the clients that I've had, I've also worked with a variety of clients. There are some clients that I'll be honest are sending me emails at eight or nine o'clock at night. And there are other clients that might have a certain different balance. I think it all depends on the category, all depends on the culture of the company. And I don't think there's kind of a one size fits all answer to that. Um, I just thought I'd throw that over to April and see we check with you, April, if you have any thoughts around like life work balance. I know you've definitely paid your dues on both sides of the desk. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and I think it definitely depends on what stage of life you're in, right? So, um, you know, I've, I've had all the stages from being a new employee to uh, being a mom uh, of two children. Um, and so, um, you know, certainly things change within that. But I would say in general, that on the client side, you tend to have more control of your schedule. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not, don't have nights where you work till midnight or one o'clock, but in past kind of normal working hours, eight to six or whatever, um, if you're working past that, you're typically uh, working a little bit more solo by your choice. Um, versus the agency side, uh, my experience was there were, there it was a little more, um, I don't know, volatile is the right word, but you know, there was a lot of ups and downs. And, and you know, when I had the, the great opportunity to work on new business development, there's nothing better than you know, being uh, up till two in the morning and the juices are flowing. And, and so, um, you know, and, and you're more at the mercy of the client schedule of, of when their deliverables are due. So, um, but you know, there's plenty of people that work in the agency side and are able to manage within, you know, um, working hours, but I also think that, you know, people have different times when they're most, you know, um, when their, their best work comes out. So there are people on the client side that work at two in the morning because that's when they work best, right? Um, there's people on the agency side that, you know, are, are don't even come in till 10 and work till 2 a.m. because that's when they work best. So the, the more uh, your employer is um, flexible, and I think what's happened during COVID has certainly enabled that, um, you know, to let people work when they're, when they're, their, their brain is, is able to work. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. And I, I do want to ask one last question before we, um, go to our breakout sessions. I think it's an important one and actually Shivram, I'd like to throw this one to you if that's okay. Um, from a client perspective, what makes for an ideal agency relationship? Um, I, I think a couple of things. Um, one is uh, a, a shared vision um, and common values and goals. Um, I think being able to understand, especially when you're on that kind of hunt and search for a new agency, um, finding an agency that has the same vision as you, I think, and the same values as you is really important. Um, and I think it's been a very helpful process uh, as we move along. Um, I think the, the second thing in terms of having like that, that great agency is um, 
from a marketing perspective, I got to give you good stuff to work with as a brand and a good client. And so making sure that we have that great relationship so that I can provide good content, but also have that pushback in terms of like, I, I don't, I can't do anything with this. And so when you've got a great relationship that allows for that push and pull that I think makes it a much more robust conversation and then leads to much stronger, better work. And how do you do that? Are there certain questions that you're thinking about or um, can you walk us through sort of what your thought process is? Yeah, um, you know, I think, you know, the, the questions that uh, come to mind to me when you're working with uh, a new agency there is one, you know, uh, I, I hope that you're going to bring me work or bring me something that's going to either scare me or shock me, depending on the, the type of um, phase of business that I'm in today. If I'm in that growth phase or if I'm in that turnaround phase, I want you to bring me work that's going to be a little bit more boundary pushing in terms of uh, the content. And I think the, the questions that I need to ask are one, do you understand my business and what we're trying to do? Uh, two, what are the areas that you're most focused on and where can we make sure that we have the best partnership together? And then I think three, um, what's the information that I can provide to you to make this the most successful partnership? And I think that's such a great way to frame it, that it's a partnership. It's not, you know, just a, a vendor that you're pulling in. I think some, sometimes the best relationships between clients and agencies happen when there is that partnership in place. Um, so I think that's a really great place for us to pause. Uh, I could go on all night. We have a lot of great questions and the panel, you guys have been fantastic. Um, for all of the attendees, I know we were not able to get to all of your questions. We have so many great questions, but please take your questions with you and select one of the uh, Zoom networking rooms that we have listed in the chat. So again, uh, Shivram and myself will be in one room. Beverly will be joining Vijay in a room. Andrew and Candy Lee will be in a room and April and Roy Wallen will be in a room. So we're going to adjourn this larger session and move into our smaller sessions. And again, thank you so much to our panel. You guys have been fantastic. Like I said, I could totally go on for another hour and a half, no problem. Um, but we'll continue this in our networking session. So thank you everyone for attending and we'll see you in just a moment in uh, the, the new room.